Japanese warships sail toward Port Arthur at the southernmost tip of Manchuria. Russian forces are unaware of the impending doom that's creeping toward them. In the coming months, hundreds of thousands will be slaughtered in the most catastrophic war the world has ever seen. The events of the Russo-Japanese War will set the foundation for what is to come. When the first shots are fired from Japanese naval vessels, World War Zero will begin. The year is 1868. It's 36 years before the Russo-Japanese War. The Maiji are in control of the Japanese government, and they have a new idea of what the island nation should look like. Europe and the West have long dominated the world with their colonial endeavors. It is the industrialization, technological advances, and power that the Meiji want. They do not care for the idea of westernizing Japan, but they certainly want to modernize it to become an imperial power in the region. Over the next several years, Japan will ramp up production, purchase modern weapons and vessels from the West, and set their sights on targets across the sea. It's these ambitions that will lead to global conflict. This dispute will be contained to Eastern Asia, but the fighting and consequences are eerily similar to what will be seen in the coming decades as the First and Second World Wars break out. It's for this reason that the Russo-Japanese War could have been renamed World War Zero. As the 19th century comes to a close, the Japanese government and its people dedicate their lives to increasing Japan's power and influence. Their first target sits across the Sea of Japan. Korea and the people who live there are seen by many Japanese citizens as being inferior, an idea strikingly similar to how Europeans viewed non-white cultures across the world at the time. Everyone in Japan agrees they should conquer Korea, but the how and the when divides factions within the country. Some believe that Japan should wait and become stronger before launching a colonization campaign. Others think the time to strike is now. During the decades before the 20th century, the Japanese population is taxed heavily by the government. This is done to help modernize the nation and purchase technology from the West. However, the Japanese people want to see tangible results from the money and resources they're giving to the cause. Most claim that if Japan could start a colony, it'll show progress toward modernization. And since Korea is the most obvious candidate for such an expansion, Japan begins planning the spread of its sphere of dominance. At the same time as the Japanese dream of modernization and expansion, Russia is having aspirations of its own. Russia is already an imperial power with lands conquered in Central Asia and the Middle East. It controls a huge amount of territory that spans the Asian continent and into Europe. To increase its ability to move goods and troops across its vast empire, Russia decides to build the Trans-Siberian Railway that will reach from its western borders all the way to the port of Vladivostok that sits on the Sea of Japan. Russia has been encroaching on the territories of East Asia for some time. In 1861, they even attacked Japan during the Tsushima incident. The Russian Empire needs more access to ports that are free of ice year-round, since much of its coastal territory resides in the Arctic. They attempt to establish a permanent anchorage on the coast of the island of Tsushima. This island is under Japanese control and leads to aggression between Japan and Russia, which will carry over to war in the years to come. But Russia isn't the only one testing the boundaries. Japan needs to assert dominance over other Asian powers in the region if it's ever going to colonize Korea. This leads to the First Sino-Japanese War in 1894. It'll be the first major conflict that Japan engages in under the Meiji Restoration government. The war is brutal and bloody, but will be nothing compared to the fight to come. Following the war between China and Japan, Russia begins encroaching closer and closer to lands that Japan has its sights on. By 1897, a Russian fleet is housed at Port Arthur in Manchuria. This is where the war will begin, as Russian presence in the region poses a real threat to Japanese colonial ambitions. China leases Port Arthur to Russia, cementing a tentative alliance between the two nations. Alliances between countries set the foundation for world wars. When multiple countries are pulled into a conflict and have to choose a side, there's a cascade effect that drowns every ally into the war. In the future, the central powers will be pitted against the allies, and a couple of decades after that, the allies will have to fight for the survival of the planet against the Axis powers. In the conflict to come between Russia and Japan, there will be hidden alliances, which is one of the reasons that it could be renamed World War Zero. Russia and Japan don't necessarily want to go to war. They try to negotiate and come to an understanding. At first, everything seems to be going well. Japanese ambassador Ito Hirobumi believes Japan cannot win a direct conflict with Russia, so he proposes that a compromise be reached. Russia can control Manchuria, and in exchange, Japan will be allowed to colonize northern Korea. This seems like a fair deal to both sides. However, while negotiations are happening, Japan signs the Anglo-Japanese alliance with Britain. Britain is not a fan of Russia, 
and sees them as a threat. They want to keep Russia out of the Pacific waters to protect their own interests and believe Japan will help them with this mission. The alliance also means that if any other country allies itself with Russia in the coming conflict, Britain will enter the war on the side of Japan. Again, all it will take is a little pressure to cause the friction brewing in the Pacific to ignite in a full-blown world war. When Russia receives word of this new alliance, it causes a panic. For a while now, they've been receiving aid from both Germany and France. If war breaks out, both of these countries will need to remain out of the conflict to prevent Britain from directly fighting alongside Japan. Knowing this, Japan begins to become more aggressive. Either way, they'll be able to take on Russia alone or will fight the world with Britain, which is arguably the most powerful empire in the world on their side. There's also another factor that Russia needs to consider. Germany is their closest ally. In fact, Tsar Nicholas II of Russia and Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany are cousins. And as will become very clear in the years to come, the rulers of Germany are not the most accepting people. Wilhelm constantly writes letters to Nicholas praising him as the savior of the white race, who is protecting Europe from impure Asian peoples. Much of Europe still holds racist views towards other parts of the world, but Wilhelm II might be the most vocal about his disdain for anyone who is not of white descent. Wilhelm continuously pushes Nicholas II to conquer more of Asia. He promises that Germany will support them in any way he can. Secretly, Kaiser Wilhelm II is trying to wedge himself between France and Russia to weaken the Franco-Russian alliance. If Germany is Russia's only ally, then it can count on them for its future plans to dominate Europe. Again, alliances forged during the coming conflict between Russia and Japan are laying the framework for the world wars to come. It is likely a combination of Wilhelm II whispering in the Russian emperor's ear and promises that Germany will provide Russia with aid in the future situations that embolden them to escalate things in the Far East. Even though the Trans-Siberian Railway is not yet complete, the Emperor of Russia is sure that his men will be able to conquer Asia and defeat the Japanese threat. Russia promises to remove troops from Manchuria to ease tensions in the region. Japan waits with bated breath, but the withdrawal never happens. The Japanese citizens are angry with the Russians and their own government. Protests break out to force the leaders of Japan to act, and they once again sit down at the table with Russia to try to work things out diplomatically. Russia appears to be working toward maintaining good relations in the region. They promise that Japan will be able to claim Korea without any intervention. They tell the Japanese ambassadors that their troops will leave the area and that there can be peace between the two empires. Yet, this is all a lie. For the next few years, tensions are high. Russia makes promises they don't keep and Japan becomes bolder because of their alliances. As the 20th century begins, Emperor Gojong of Korea believes that the disagreements between Russia and Japan will keep both countries at bay. He states that Korea will be neutral in any conflict that occurs. Unfortunately, neither side cares what Korea wants, and their land and people are seen as a prize to be won by both Russia and Japan. Negotiations continue into January of 1904. It's now become clear to Japan that Russia is full of lies and deception. They were never trying to come to an agreement. Nicholas II was only trying to bide time to build up his military. The Tsar was never going to leave Manchuria or let Japan have Korea. The most tragic part is that war isn't Nicholas's first choice. The Tsar actually did want to come to a sort of an agreement to avoid an armed conflict. But yet again, Kaiser Wilhelm continues to encourage war. He tells Nicholas that with the help of Germany, Tsar Nicholas II can become Admiral of the Pacific, while Wilhelm himself will be Admiral of the Atlantic has a nice ring to it, and Wilhelm paints a picture of a dual German-Russian empire that will rule all of Europe and Asia. From there, they'll conquer Britain and divide its empire between them. In the end, Germany and Russia will rule the world. All that needs to happen now is for World War Zero to commence so that in the next war, Wilhelm and Nicholas can destroy any remaining enemies and create their global empire. However, none of this can happen until Russia defeats Japan. And the only way that will happen is if Nicholas can get enough troops, weapons, and supplies to the Eastern Front before Japan realizes that there will never be any peace between them. On February 6, 1904, the Japanese minister to Russia is recalled to the homeland. Two days later, Japan will declare war on Russia, but not before launching a sneak attack against their enemy. Japan knows the longer they wait to force an agreement, the stronger the Russian military will become. They need to strike first, and the time is now. The negotiations are over. On the night of February 8, 1904, three hours before the official declaration of war, Admiral Togo Heihachiro orders his torpedo boats to fire upon the Russian ships docked in Port Arthur. The attack damages the Cesarevich and the Retvizan, two of the most powerful battleships in the Russian fleet. Nicholas II is absolutely shocked. He never in his wildest dreams thought Japan would attack without a formal declaration of war. 
When Russia voices its outrage at the unprovoked attack on their fleet, Japan just cites the fact that Russia did the same thing to Sweden in 1808. So really, they have no reason to complain. Nicholas II has also been told by his military advisors that Japan would be too afraid to stand up to the might of the Russian Empire. The Tsar had believed this faulty information, and now his forces will pay dearly for it. The Japanese ships try to circle around the Russian fleet, but the coast blocks their path. The vessels unleash a barrage of shells at one another. Many plunge harmlessly into the waters of the Yellow Sea, but some hit their mark, and sailors on both sides perish. One such casualty is Admiral Stepan Osipovich Makarov. The death of their leader throws the Russian fleet into disarray. The Russian captains order their ships to remain in the harbor, as they know an open water battle will be impossible to win. While the fighting rages on in the waters off the Manchurian coast, the Japanese land ground forces on mainland Korea. These soldiers secure towns and cities as they proceed across the Korean peninsula toward the Russian naval base at Port Arthur. Since Japan invaded his country, Emperor Gojong sent 17,000 troops to aid the Russian forces. However, the Japanese Imperial Army continues to push forward, and by April they're preparing to cross the Yalu River into Russian-occupied Manchuria. To keep the Russian fleet from escaping and supplies from reaching their troops, the Japanese Navy sets up a blockade of Port Arthur. They sink several concrete-filled steamships just outside the port, but the water is too deep and this tactic is ineffective. The Russian flagship Petropavlovsk and the Pobeda try to slip out but strike mines as they maneuver through the waters of the bay. The flagship sinks, and the Pobeda needs to be towed back to port. The escape is a complete and utter failure. While the Russian ships try to retreat, the Japanese army moves in to secure the hilltops overlooking Port Arthur. It is fiercely held by the Russians, and thousands of Japanese soldiers lose their lives. The Japanese artillery unleashes a rain of iron on the hilltop positions, and Japanese soldiers eventually overtake the Russian troops. From above the port, artillery units begin to shell the ships in the harbor. The Russian fleet cannot reach the entrenched Japanese cannons and suffer a disastrous amount of damage. The Russian army tries to reclaim the hills but is held back by the fortified Japanese forces. After sustaining heavy casualties on both sides, the Russian general in charge of the counterattack calls it off. The fleet is all but lost. Port Arthur is no longer of much strategic significance to the Red Army. Before and during the conflict, British intelligence provides Japan with detailed information about Russian movements. Using the Indian Army with stations in Malaya and China, the British frequently intercept communications between different battalions of the Russian military. This information is then passed on to the Japanese. But this is a two-way street. The British are clearly no friend to the Russians, and so, in return, Japanese intelligence shares any information with Britain as well. Even though this is not a war between Britain and Russia, there are definitely tensions building between the two nations. As information is shared, the British and Japanese are shocked to find just how much aid Germany is sending Russia. This puts Britain on high alert, as they now perceive Germany to be one of the biggest threats in Europe, and in the following decade, they'll find out just how right they are. Russian military leaders begin to get nervous. Japanese forces are continuously winning battles and pushing them further from the coast. The only thing they can do is dig in and resist the wave of Japanese soldiers crashing against their front lines like surges in a storm. The Russian goal is to slow the Japanese advance to give workers enough time to complete the Trans-Siberian Railway. This will allow Russia to resupply its forces and send more troops in to aid the war effort. On May 1, 1904, the Battle of the Yalu River begins. Japanese troops cross the river and overwhelm the Russian position. The bloody battle lasts only a day. It's the first major land battle of the war, and by the end, Russian forces are in retreat. The illusion that the Japanese army would never be able to stand up to Russia is shattered. This is the first battle in decades that an Asian military force has beaten a European one. It's very clear to Tsar Nicholas II that something needs to be done, or Japan might decimate his forces, leading to Russia losing a vast amount of territory in the region. He orders the Baltic fleet to sail halfway across the world to aid in the war effort. As the ships pass through the North Sea, the fleet encounters British fishing vessels, which they mistake for enemy torpedo boats. The Russian fleet opens fire and sinks the British ships. This event causes a ripple across the British Empire that almost leads to World War I. Britain and Russia realize they are not willing to fight a war with one another quite yet and let bygones be bygones. After the incident in the North Sea, the Russian fleet continues south along the European coast. When they reach the Suez Canal, the fleet splits into two forces. The smaller ships make their way through the Mediterranean, while the larger vessels circle around the Cape of Good Hope 
to reach the Indian Ocean and eventually Pacific waters. At the beginning of 1905, Japanese forces claimed the area surrounding Port Arthur. They continually push the Russian army back toward their borders. Winter is coming, and both the Japanese and Russian forces know that it would be a grave mistake to try to launch a new campaign into the frigid weather of northern Asia. The two sides set up outposts and entrenched themselves along 70 miles of front lines just south of Mukden. But it seems time is on Russia's side. The Trans-Siberian Railway is nearing completion. Japanese generals know they must eliminate the Russian threat before this happens, or all could be lost. On February 20, 1905, Japan launches a series of offensives against the left flanks of the Russian army in what comes to be known as the Battle of Mukden. Half a million men are part of this conflict, and it'll be like nothing the world has ever seen. As if providing a glimpse into the future of world wars, the Japanese and Russian soldiers slaughter one another supported by hundreds of artillery cannons on both sides. This is the first time a land battle has been waged using modern weapons that can cause massive amounts of death and destruction in such a short amount of time. The Japanese soldiers push against the sides of the Russian contingent, and both the left and right flanks begin to cave. The Russians fall back. Their generals see that if they don't do something quickly, their forces will be encircled, and all will be lost. They call for a general retreat. Russian soldiers are scared and confused. They never thought it was possible that the Japanese would be able to defeat them. After three weeks of fighting and dying, General Kuropatkin orders the complete withdrawal of Russian forces from Mukden. When the Russians take stock of the soldiers they've lost, it's discovered that around 90,000 men perished in the battle. By all indications, Japan is winning the war. Nicholas II is very afraid. His military is on the brink of collapse. Even though they've caused massive casualties to the Russian army, Japan has lost thousands and thousands of men. They do not have the soldiers to pursue the Russian army deeper into Chinese territory. The only way that Japan can decisively win this war is by controlling the seas, and with the Baltic fleet on its way, the Japanese navy must prepare for a battle that will decide the outcome of the war. The Baltic fleet reaches the Sea of Japan in May 1905. The world has been following the movements of the Russian ships, as it's the first time a naval force of this size has traveled across the world to fight a war. The logistics of this expedition are staggering. The ships run on coal and cannot carry enough reserves to make it from the Baltic Sea to the Pacific Ocean. Therefore, they need to refuel along the way. However, to keep the peace between the nations of Europe, the Russian fleet is not allowed to pick up coal at neutral ports. The Russians get around the problem by loading supply ships with around 500,000 tons of coal to follow the Russian fleet and resupply their ships whenever they need more fuel. Admiral Togo knows that the Russian vessels are heading toward the only other large port that Russia controls in the region, Vladivostok. He orders Japanese naval vessels to be repaired and rearmed for the coming battle. If he cannot stop the Baltic fleet from reaching Vladivostok, victory might slip through Japan's fingers. Togo does not know exactly where the Russian fleet will approach from, and there is a vast amount of water to cover. He only has four battleships and one second-class battleship at his disposal. However, Japan still has most of its cruisers, destroyers, and torpedo boats, which will be useful for covering large areas to locate the enemy fleet. Unfortunately for Japan, the Russian naval force consists of eight battleships, including four that are Borodino-class. These ships are supported by several destroyers and other auxiliary vessels, meaning that the Russian fleet comes in at 38 vessels. This will be a difficult naval battle to win, but Japan has no choice if they want to end the war. The Russian fleet decides to take the shortest route to Vladivostok by traveling between Korea and Japan. They only move at night to avoid detection by the Japanese Navy. Unfortunately for Russia, their two hospital ships sail under the rules of war and burn their lights all night long. The Japanese armed merchant cruiser Shinanu Maru spots the lights and informs Admiral Togo of the Russians' location. He immediately launches the full might of the Japanese Navy. Togo positions his fleet directly in the path of the Russian ships. They're cut off from reaching Vladivostok. On May 27th, the Japanese vessels open fire at the incoming Russian fleet at the Tsushima Straits. Japanese shells and torpedoes decimate the Russian ships. All of the Russian battleships are sunk, over 5,000 men are lost, and most of the auxiliary craft are damaged beyond repair. Russia has lost the war. There's only one thing Tsar Nicholas II can do. Fighting continues for three more months before Nicholas II calls for peace talks. This is where things get very interesting, and it's one of the main reasons that the Russo-Japanese War could be renamed World War Zero. The President of the United States offers to lead peace talks between the two nations. Both agree. The meetings are held in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. It's here that the Treaty of Portsmouth is signed on September 5, 1905, officially ending the Russo-Japanese War. However, this treaty also lays the groundwork for the world wars in the coming decades. 
Japan thought the United States would support them in peace talks, since they had a somewhat close relationship before the war started. Russia and the United States, on the other hand, had no real ties. However, when Russia refused to pay indemnities to Japan for the war, Theodore Roosevelt sided with Nicholas II. This painted a clear picture that the US had its sights set on interests in the Pacific and needed a way to keep Japan in check. This may have been one of the key factors that would later lead to a conflict in World War II. Along with Roosevelt winning the Nobel Peace Prize for his role in negotiations, Russia agreed that Korea was now a part of Japan's sphere of influence and removed their troops from Manchuria. These concessions would also likely be a driving factor in the brutality with which Soviet Russia plowed through the region to reach Japan at the end of World War II. And just like the Peace Treaty of Versailles at the end of World War I, which left many issues unresolved and set the groundwork for the rise of the Nazi Party in World War II, the Treaty of Portsmouth left a lot unresolved. These issues and alliances forged before and during the war set some of the groundwork for the global conflict in the following decade. This is why the Russo-Japanese War might be considered World War Zero, which eventually led to World War I and continued into World War II. Now watch How Did World War I Start? Or check out World War II Didn't End Like You Think It Did.